income inequality is deepening within Canadian cities. And you saw these issues emerge in the last federal election with each party talking about what they're going to do to, to strengthen the middle income group. And what we see in Canada is that from 1997 to 2013, Canada's richest 1% net nearly a third of all income growth, surpassing anything we've seen before in Canadian history. So the question in the back of your mind through all this might be, have we just invited some, some revolutionary Marxists to come talk to us about class warfare at, at GIS Day? Maybe. But I can also push a really pragmatic argument on you about why income inequality matters. So there's this economist named Joseph Stiglitz, and he wrote a book called The Price of Inequality. And he finds that widely unequal societies do not function efficiently, and their economies are neither stable nor sustainable in the long term. And as a geographer and as a cartographer that pulled this book together, we're, we're really interested in talking about the, the geographic or the spatial dimensions of income inequality. So look, like, inequality is hardly a new issue for cities. You know, especially not in Winnipeg when 96 years ago we had the Winnipeg General Strike, especially not when 60 years ago you're going to be hearing about Adrian talking about a Métis shantytown in Winnipeg. However, for, for cities in the 21st century, increasing income inequality is creating these new and powerful spatial divisions within our cities. And it's building on this knowledge of growing income inequality that I'm part of this cross-Canada research project called the Neighborhood Change Research Study that explores the geographic impacts of, of inequality in six Canadian cities. We're looking at it in Vancouver, Calgary, Winnipeg, Toronto, Montreal, and Halifax, and then doing a little bit of side work in Ottawa and Hamilton at the same time. And just like every comic book hero has an origin story, we have a bit of an origin story too. In 2010, this report came out called the Three Cities Study of Toronto. And this report found that amidst growing income inequality, Toronto would separate into three separate cities. You have this city one, this, this blue city. And what's there is, is, is this high, area of high income, people living in condos, highly educated, and the vastly white area. Surrounding city one, you have this band of white, city two, which is sort of these middle income suburbs that are gradually shrinking in time. And then outside of that, you have city three, this darker area. And, and there we see this suburbanization of newcomer poverty into high rise towers. And since its foundation, this three city study has, has laid the grounds for our research across Canada. So with our neighborhood change study, it's this focus on neighborhoods, looking at the spaces directly influenced by income inequality that makes our research a little different. See, some people see urban spaces, they see rich and poor neighborhoods as evolving naturally. What many of us geographers know is that the spaces around us are anything but natural. Our neighborhoods are, are a reflection of who we are as a people. The reflection of who we are as a society. And at the same time, the geographies around us, the neighborhoods we live in, the spaces that we live in, they reproduce our society. They remake who we are as people. And so when I talk about rich and poor neighborhoods in Winnipeg, what I'm really saying is that neighborhoods matter. Where we live influences the quality of our life and the services that we receive. Some neighborhoods provide us with, a, like, they provide us with advantages and social connections that let us thrive. While other neighborhoods can make existing inequalities, existing gaps worse because they lack resources and opportunities. And so our research team here in Winnipeg is really trying to tell the story about how this growing income inequality is coming up within our city. And many of these stories come from Winnipeg's background as this very slow growing city with pronounced concentrations of urban poverty. Winnipeg really has more in common with, with once industrial cities like St. Louis, Baltimore, Philly, or, or Halifax than with these cities with pronounced concentrations of, of affluence like Toronto, Calgary, or Vancouver. And so for over 30 years, Winnipeg's really been developed by this slow growth development pattern. Uh, you know, where our population is growing at less than 1% per year. And these slow growth patterns have further entrenched existing neighborhood inequalities in a, in a city that's marked by this symbolic line separating sort of clusters of, of poverty within the inner city from a vastly more affluent suburban population. So this, with, this, with this slow growth, income inequality and polarization have not occurred to the same extent in Winnipeg as they have in Toronto, Calgary, or Vancouver. See, 
In Toronto in 2006, the richest neighborhood was about 21 times richer the city's, than the city's poorest neighborhood. The same comparison shows that in Winnipeg, the richest census tract, the richest neighborhood, was only about five and a half times richer than the city's poorest neighborhood. So it really seems like not too many of this 1% crowd are selling in Winnipeg. That gives, that sort of makes a bit of sense given the small size of our corporate head office community. But when I'm saying this, when I'm saying that this gap is not as big, I'm not saying that there's not a lot of poverty in Winnipeg. There is a lot of poverty in Winnipeg. What I'm saying is that the gap between Winnipeg's richest and poorest is not as big as it is in other cities. So I'm not trying to underplay what's going on in this city. That being said, we can still take a look at inequality in Winnipeg and sort of map it out a bit. And I just want to give some credit to, to Dr. Brian Lorch, who helped in running a lot of these numbers. He's an economic geographer, formerly with Lakehead, and, and now sort of does some work with the University of Winnipeg. So one approach to looking at income inequality is just to look at the absolute difference between Winnipeg's richest and poorest neighborhoods. In 1970, you got the Tuxedo neighborhood. It's, you know, if you're familiar with Winnipeg, it's a neighborhood surrounded by parks, and, and it reported the highest average personal income. At the other end of the scale were parts of Logan, West Alexander, and the Centennial neighborhoods, right around the, the CPR rail yards, uh, where income was about one-fifth that of the Tuxedo area. By 1980, the gap between Winnipeg's richest, poor, richest and poorest neighborhoods was shrinking, and that was partly due with the recession, and partly due with lots of people our age, lots of younger people moving out of the city. But by 2010, the income gap returned to virtually the same as it was in 1970. Tuxedo again reported the highest average personal income, while, while Logan, West Alexander, and the Centennial neighborhoods reported the lowest average individual incomes. And when we use like some statistical tools, some fancy things called Gini coefficients, we can look at income changes through time and income inequality in time. And what we find is that from 1970 to 2010, income inequality in Winnipeg rose by, by 20% between neighborhoods. Winnipeg's neighborhoods are growing less equal and is part of a long-term trend. And so we can get a bit more into GIS now and we can explore whether the growing gaps I've just described have resulted in, in significant changes to Winnipeg and, and to Winnipeg's neighborhoods. So again, some rough maps. This, this map shows the distribution of incomes in, in 2010. And you see three distinct patterns here in Winnipeg that we're all pretty aware of. You know, We see this clustering of, a, of this wedge of below average income that originates in the inner city and radiates out to the northwest to the rural municipality of Rosser. Second, you see this wedge of above average income that extends westwards from Crescent Woods and River Heights, two of Winnipeg's very longtime wealthier neighborhoods, onto the exurban fringes, onto Headingley and Charleswood. And the third thing we see, so green is higher income, the third thing we see is this band of above average income that almost completely encircles Winnipeg. And again, that makes sense for, for what many of us in this room know and what we know about Winnipeg. Winnipeg is this donut city, and when we look at income maps of Winnipeg from 1970 through, through 2011, we see increasing poverty in the inner city and this outward movement of capital to the edges of the city. And when we map income change through time, and when we sort of display it in one map, something else comes up, and this is something I wasn't expecting from this research. Something, you know, we know where poverty is in the city, we know where affluence is, but we, what we also find when we map income change in time is that we find that middle income neighborhoods are disappearing within Winnipeg. From 1980 to 2010, one quarter of Winnipeg's middle income neighborhoods disappeared. And this middle income group is getting progressively smaller in older suburban neighborhoods like the Kildonans, like Transcona, St. Vitale, and Fort Gary. So growing income inequality is also affecting the suburbs. And to, at the risk of falling back uh, sort of on some empty platitudes here, but what we, we find in Winnipeg is, yeah, rich neighborhoods are getting richer, poor neighborhoods are getting poorer, and the middle class is getting squeezed. And so when we're looking at neighborhoods, instead of me just showing a bunch of maps that don't have legends on them here, you know, it can be interesting for you to maybe hear some examples of, of neighborhoods in Winnipeg and what's going on, and some, some examples of the most extreme change in our city. So one example is the East Exchange District. You know, it's the inner city waterfront warehouse district. And we, we heard sort of talking about voting in that area, which was really interesting to see. But what we've also seen in that area is that incomes have, have moved from about one half of the city's average in 1980 to being almost two times the city's average in 2010. And so again, this, this change is tied to recent condo development, which has attracted double income households, property investors, 
but also older adults to the area. A second example of an inner city neighborhood with a positive income shift is Osborne Village. So working with urban studies at the University of Winnipeg, a lot of the time I hear students talking about gentrification and the examples they give are, you know, everyone's very interested in what's going on in West Broadway, in Point Douglas, or in Spence. But the premier example of a gentrified neighborhood in Winnipeg, a, a neighborhood that had this population displacement, is Osborne Village. See, what we find in this neighborhood is there was this concentration of rooming houses in that area, sort of a precarious housing model through the 1980s and 1990s. And with positive income shifts in that neighborhood, those housing options have almost completely disappeared from the area. And now maybe an example of a, a negative shift in income in a non-inner city neighborhood. So since we're here at the University of Manitoba, it can be interesting to talk about Winnipeg's Fort Richmond neighborhood, just, just south of the University of Manitoba campus. And you've heard this neighborhood come up in, in media conversations about rooming houses and student rooming houses in the area. And so what we're seeing in this area is, again, yeah, it's sort of following with that pattern. We're seeing a decline of incomes in that area, which is really interesting given sort of the state of student ghettos across Canada in Kingston and Kitchener-Waterloo and what a lack of investment in home ownership into certain neighborhoods does to these, these, these neighborhoods in the long term. Uh, and at the same time, Adrian here has been doing some maps of, of debt in Winnipeg. And what's interesting is that this area jumps out as a place of non-mortgage debt at the same time. So maybe like a cluster, I don't know. I don't, I'm not, we're not quite sure, but it might be this clustering of student debt in the neighborhood. But inequality doesn't just come up with income in Winnipeg. It comes up through the way things like race, ethnicity, gender, and age come together at the neighborhood level. So when we start doing some more advanced mapping and statistics, we can tie together these huge chunks of data from, from the census to understand different types of neighborhoods in Winnipeg. And we can start to see some wider spatial trends in our city. And so what this next analysis is, it's maybe to get a bit geekier for a second, it's something called a principal component analysis followed by a hierarchical cluster analysis of about 30 variables from the National Household Survey and Census and some tax filer data to classify Winnipeg's neighborhoods. And then from that, again, you won't see this from your chairs. If, I've got some books with me. If you're interested in looking at this in more detail later on, let me know. But what we see from this is that Winnipeg is a city divided not just by income, but Winnipeg is also divided by immigration status, by ethnic status, by family and housing status. And Winnipeg is also divided by residential mobility, how often people move around, and the types of housing opportunities people have. And so by understanding the different types of neighborhoods within Winnipeg, we see this gendering of inequality, this gendering of poverty with a focus of single parent families led by women in Winnipeg's inner city. We see that while Aboriginal peoples represent 11% of Winnipeg's total population, they represent nearly 30% of the population living in high poverty areas. And we see the wealthiest areas are, are older and white. So academics in the past have found that racial segregation and ghettoization, sorry, is that a cutoff? Okay. Uh, racial segregation and ghettoization don't occur to the same extent in Winnipeg as in many American cities like Chicago, Baltimore, and Toronto. Those cities aren't the gold standard for, for what's going on with our city. And so when we look at the structure of neighborhood types in Winnipeg, we find that Winnipeg's geographic divisions still fall along ethnic lines. That Winnipeg's inner city is synonymous with both Aboriginal and non-white populations while the fringes of our city are white? Well, this testifies to some very deep structural processes that divide our city by race. It speaks to the legacies of colonialism and unequal opportunities for Indigenous Winnipeggers, and it speaks to privileges for those of us that are white. And now, those lessons are obvious to Winnipeggers. You know, a lot of what I'm saying here with income maps of Winnipeg, we know this, we know where poverty is, we know where affluence is. But when we describe what Winnipeg's divisions look like on the ground, we're one step closer to bridging those divides. And so when I say Winnipeg is a divided city, I mean a few things. This concept of a divided city really re argues that our city is a reflection of broader social trends. So increasing income inequality is reflected in these stark spatial separations between have and have not neighborhoods. In divided city, different neighborhoods are increasingly separated by by physical difference, by, by the built environment, by different housing types, and by different urban policy structures. And more than that, what I think really jumps out about a divided city, it means that there's this 
lack of interaction between different groups of people. Since we don't live around each other, we don't talk to each other, we don't share from each other, we don't collaborate together, we don't spend time learning from each other. Basically, in a divided city, the, the fences that separate our neighborhoods are growing taller, they're growing wider. And now just to wrap up quickly, I'll skip through some of this stuff. But what gives me some hope is that when we talk about Winnipeg as a divided city, there's some momentum building here in Winnipeg. There's been more and more of these conversations coming up recently, more and more people presenting on this, more and more people interested in, in engaging and collaborating. And I think it's events like this, events that bring us together to talk about these issues that bring us one step closer to bridging Winnipeg's divides. Thank you.